going to introduce me on as a speaker. Yeah. I, would you like me to introduce I will say this right. now? So let me um, <laughs> tell you a few things about uh, Anna. She is a committee member of the Research Centre for German and Austrian Exile Studies and a trustee of inside, Insiders Stroke Outsiders, which we'll be hearing about. She taught German, French and Italian at Imperial College London for some 30 years and completed her PhD at the University of London in Exile Studies in 2009 on the subject of refugee art publishers in Britain. Since then, she has published books and articles on the refugees from Nazism to Britain in the fields of fashion, publishing and art and design. She co-produced a film on refugee designers, which has been shown in Vienna, Budapest and other cities. She's lectured in Prague, Vienna and Leipzig, as well as in the UK. And Anna, let me hand over to you. Thank you. Well, um, you'll understand if we're rather in disarray. We found out a few minutes ago that Monica was going to be here and she was to do all of this, the uh, introductory talk and so on. Um, so just explain very briefly um, how it all came about. It was Monica's idea. I have got into the habit of calling her Monica's mushrooms because she has these <laughs> scores of ideas which constantly shoot up into wonderful, wonderful fungi. And uh, this particular mushroom, she said I, she always wanted to do um, an event on childhood, refugees and childhood, uh, which proved to be an extremely wide and varied and rich scene. Um, and so it was that she, um, with a little bit of help from me, introduced uh, and, and organized a symposium in December 2021, a very long time ago. Um, it seems now. And we had speakers from literally all over the world. We had um, a paper from Israel, one from Australia. Obviously, those people can't be with us tonight. Perhaps some of them may be on Zoom. Um, but um, I think you'll agree if you see the book, it's, uh, yes, as I said, it's proved to be a very interesting topic. Um, it has a slight a slant towards Monica's own interest, which is art history. There are several chapters on aspects of uh, both art and illustration and, and so on, as you will see. So we have here um, a selection of the speakers, one of them is also myself, and we're literally just going to give you a five minute taster each on the, uh, the chapters that we were involved in. And after that, there will be a chance uh, to ask questions or make comments. Um, and then followed by um, the, the great generosity, thanks to Catherine Robson of New York University, who have hosted us tonight, and also not only given us a lovely venue, but provided drinks and um, some food as well, which you are very welcome to take part in. So uh, that's my bit done, I think, more or less. Um, Shall I go straight into my yes into my talk? <laughs> okay, now I can change my expression and <laughs> and find my talk. Yes, Let's try to look more serious now. <laughs> so, um, I'm sorry, I haven't got any slides. My particular chapter isn't a very visual subject. Others will do better on that front. Uh, it's not an art subject. I, I have the very first chapter in the book. It's entitled Motherhood in British Exile. So it deals with the, the beginning of it, of it all, it, which was the decision um, for refugee women in particular, should they have children at this very, very difficult time? What did it mean in the late 1930s to, to give birth? Would it be totally irresponsible? Um, and I based the, um, based the chapter on letters and diary entries and some autobiographical extracts as well. Uh, the first person who comes into my chapter is called uh, Hilde Kurz. Uh, she was married to somebody called Otto Kurz. Hello, David. Otto Kurz, um, who was a Warburg scholar. Now, she, Hilde, had studied art history in Vienna with uh, Ernst Gombrich and Otto Kurz, and she was as qualified an art historian as they were, but she didn't have a good job in Britain. 
and she ended up doing index work for various people, including Kenneth Clark. Um, and so to have a child was actually probably a pretty risky thing to do in 1939, or well, she gave birth actually in 1940. So she finds herself pregnant in 1939. And, uh, this is what she wrote to her sister, Ilse, who had fled from Vienna to America. And she wrote in English because, of course, that was a way of uh, speeding things up. If you wrote in German, then it would be held up in censorship for quite a long time. She writes, don't you think this is the most unlucky moment? I never would have dared to see it through if Susie, who was their, their sister living in Italy, that's where she'd gone, had not done the same under similar circumstances. And we, meaning she and her husband Otto, both want it so terribly. Anyway, there it seems to be, and I would never have the heart to have it taken away. There is quite enough killing of innocent Jews. So you see that I'm glad on the whole, which is an undeniable advantage in these dark times. And so uh, she gave birth to baby Erica Barrett um, in 1940, I've said. So what were the other challenges then for refugee women? They had to be able to work, but of course the, they all knew that World War II was coming. How did you look after a baby in a war with bombing? What about supplies? And worse, supposing you were interned, many women and children were, not as many as men, but that was a risk. And a much greater risk was if your husband was interned, and that did in fact happen to Hilda. Otto Kurz was uh, interned, and that's a whole story in itself, because being an art historian, she got her artist friends to uh, draw pictures and paint pictures of baby uh, Erika so that when her husband was released he would know what he'd missed seeing her as a newborn. The other person is Hilda Spiel, some of you may know her as a novelist in her own right, uh, married to a journalist. Um, she gave birth to three children during the sort of wartime period, roughly, the, the, unfortunately the second child died at birth, which was horrendous. But when she finally fell pregnant, um, not that long after uh, that, that second birth, um, she found that it gave her a huge sense of joy and optimism. And she says in, in her diary, um, sorry, just on my page, yes, a third child was on the way, conceived under bombs to be born among bombs. She even found that far from adding to the nightly terror caused by the bombs, her baby son distracted her from the fear up in my room, I didn't pay much attention to the V1s and V2s, Hitler's weapons of revenge. My joy in the child was too great. So there you can see a child already as a symbol of optimism and hope for the future. Uh, other women were not so lucky. We have a, a Susan Einzig, um, who was a, an artist in her own right and became a well-known illustrator, uh, who really had a child from a casual relationship because she was dreadfully lonely. And, and she had quite a, a traumatic time. Um, so apart from that, post-war, how do the women bring up, not just, I'm saying women, of course, you have to understand that it was largely women in those days who had the, the task of child uh, rearing, but I do talk about the, uh, the, the fathers as well. How should they bring up their children? Should they speak English only? Or what about German? That was part of their heritage. But on the other hand, you know, the Nazis, the Nazi experience had marked many people for life. So all of these considerations. And my final point is that having a child actually helped many of the women to integrate. They suddenly would find themselves reading children's books and singing children's British children's songs and saying rhymes. And this was a way of helping them to become uh, part of um, British society, you could say culturally at least. So thank you very much for that. And our next speaker, Charming Brinson, will now be uh, introduced. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And now I'm happy to introduce your co-editor of this volume, Charming Brinson, who is Emeritus Professor in German at Imperial College London and a founder member of the Research Centre for German and Austrian Exile Studies at the University of London. 
She's published extensively on German and Austrian exiles in Britain between 1933 and 1950 on subjects ranging from Austrian center and free German League of culture to internment and postal history. Her particular research interests are political exile and women in exile. And this is the next one. Okay, so my contribution to this volume, in this sense and experience, is entitled In Loco Parentis, the work of the refugee youth organisations, Young Austria and Free German Youth in Wartime Britain. And this chapter perhaps adopts a rather different take on refugee youth as compared with the other contributions, and it examines examples of self-help from within the refugee community. These two clubs were by no means the only clubs set up by or for refugee youth during the wartime years, but they were undoubtedly the best known, each after a time coming under the umbrella of one of the largest scale adult refugee organisations in Britain, so Young Austria fell under that of the Austrian Centre, and Free German Youth under the Free German Legal Culture. It's notable that despite the fact that one youth group was Austrian and the other German, their scope and development should prove so similar. Each was founded shortly before the war as multi-party, multi-faith, anti-fascist organizations by the young people themselves. They sought to offer young refugees from around the age of 14, upwards to around 25, who were often alone and adrift in London, wartime London, to offer them a meeting place, a familiar, a nurturing environment and a degree of pastoral care. This was achieved firstly through regular Heimabende uh, youth uh, club meetings, where members could be introduced to one another, exchange experiences, sing songs, and play familiar games. And as the membership grew, so too did the scope of these organisations, which soon also provided education opportunities for young refugees whose education had been interrupted by immigration, as well as sporting possibilities, even acquiring the drama group. At their height, free German youth could boast about 600 members and young Austria as many as 1,500. As time went on, these young youth groups began to be increasingly taken over by their adult equivalents, the Austrian Centre and the Free German League, which, like the Red Junior Organisation, had always started out as non political groups, but in which the communist members came to play an increasingly important role. While during the time of the Hitler-Stalin pact, these members largely kept their political views under wraps, from the entry of the Soviet Union into the war in June 1941, the communist influence was rather more overt in the adult, but also in the youth groups. One of the ways in which this became evident was in political instruction for those who were viewed as potential cadre members, and also following the party line from Moscow, in urging the young members to plan to return to their respective homelands after the war to take part in physical, political, and moral reconstruction there. Both young Austrians and free German youth were encouraged to take a pride in their Austrian or German nationality above and beyond fascism. But here, the similarity between the groups ended. The young Austrians were encouraged to view Austrian culture as being quite separate from German culture. So Austrian music, for example, Austrian literature. It was more difficult for the young Germans, obviously, to take a pride in their Germanness, but they were nevertheless encouraged to be proud of their cultural heritage and revolutionary history. The Austrians, even those who remembered only too well the welcome Hitler had received when, when entering Austria, were encouraged by the announcement from the Allies in late 1943 that Austria had been Hitler's first victim instead of bearing equal culpability for Hitler's crimes. By then, the youth groups that had started out of primary pastoral in nature were becoming increasingly politicized, covertly or overtly, in the care of their impressionable young members. Suitable, in commas, suitable members uh, became functionaries, 
of whom much was expected in terms of propaganda activities. The poet Erich Fried, for example, as a committed member of Young Austria, wrote of the impossibility of carrying out war work in the factories, plus working for the party and still having time left over for his poetry. His friend, another young Austrian poet, Hans Schmeier, was in fact driven to suicide by the conflicting demands on his time. But it should be noted that other members of the youth groups remain quite unaware of the political agenda, viewing their organisation as a welcome home from home in difficult times. I already mentioned that the young members were urged to return home after the war, and although exact figures are not available, it's probably true to say about a third did so. The young Germans largely opting for the Soviet zone, later the GDR, for political reasons. But neither in Austria nor Germany was their integration into post-war society easy. They still encountered anti-Semitism and in Austria, anti-communism. Moreover, in the GDR, young returnees from Britain were condemned as less immigrants and were thought to be inferior to those returning from the Soviet Union. Even the leading functionaries who persuaded the young people to return admitted later that their advice had perhaps not been in their best interests. So I'd just like to end anyway with the word of a former member of Free German News, Alfred Fleischhacker, who returned to GDR and lived the rest of his life there. He wrote, after all, most of us had arrived in Britain without parents or relatives. Uh, for everyone, including myself, Free German Youth offered us all a kind of substitute for parents and siblings. It was our family. Yeah, thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to ask Tony Rebel to speak. Tony is the son of Jewish refugees who fled from Vienna to London in 1938 educated at Oxford and lectured in German at the universities of Reading, Bristol and Westminster from 1971 to 1996. He worked for the Association of Jewish Refugees London, including as editor of its monthly publication, AJR Journal, from 2006 to 2017. He's a founder member of the Research Centre for German and Austrian Exile Studies at the University of London, and since 2013 he's acted as its chair. He served for several years as a member of the executive committee of the Gesellschaft für Exilforschung, which has recently awarded him honorary membership. He's published widely in the field of exile studies, principally on the refugees from Nazism who settled in Britain after 1933. Thank you very much. Um, my chapter in, in this volume uh, deals with the representation of trauma in literary works by writers who arrived in this country as children. Um, there's a lot of that, of course, um, both trauma and writing. <laughs> um, and so I decided uh, not to cherry pick, but just to choose five of what I consider to be the best uh, literary works um, and to see what I could find. Um, three of the five writers that I chose, I think, would be on more or less everybody's list. That is Judith Tao, Laura Siegel, um, and Eva Feiges, who are all um, known writers. Uh, Judith Tao is interesting because she is, on the surface at least, uh, one of the least traumatised writers you could imagine. Um, but nonetheless, in the second volume of her autobiographical trilogy, that's the one that follows uh, When Hitler Stole Pink Rabbit, uh, there is a clear example of trauma, of uh, a suppressed fear of being hunted down by the Nazis. She has a recurrent dream in the summer of 1940, uh, the height of the um, invasion scare. Uh, they lived very near here, uh, the Kerr family, and she had a recurrent nightmare about uh, SS parachutists landing in black jackets with swastikas in Russell Square, um, where the, the British had put uh, various metal objects just precisely to stop such, such landings. 
And although it's perfectly reasonable for, for um, refugees to be afraid of um, Nazi invasion, this seems to go a good deal further. It's, it, it, she had a panic attack and so on. Um, uh, Laura Siegel, uh, who arrived uh, on a kinder transport, her parents following afterwards, um, conveys the uh, mentality of a child traumatized by, by being sent to a foreign country by herself in an extraordinarily skillful stylistic way. Um, she, she, you, 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 it's really um, worth reading other people's houses, uh, which is, is the title of, of the book. Um, she conveys her experiences in a sort of out of body fashion, as if she weren't herself experiencing what she is experiencing, as if she's looking down on herself from uh, an outside point of view. It's flat and unemotional um, and almost in a disembodied voice. Um, Eva Feige is, is the clearest example of, um, the, of, of, of trauma. Um, Many years after the event in the late 60s, she finds herself driving near Sarancester, where she'd been evacuated to as a child. And um, this brings back a rush of memories. And in the late 70s, she, she uh, wrote her book, Little Eden, um, which is on the surface about the evacuation. But actually, the plot is dictated by the gradual surfacing of the realization of the Holocaust, which had been suppressed both by the adults and insofar as they're aware of it, the children, uh, and how this uh, uh, comes to the surface uh, specifically much later in life when she, um, in, in the middle of a, of a, 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 a therapy session, uh, breaks down and uh, the, the nightmare, as it were, breaks through a very impressive piece of writing. The other two texts I chose, of, um, first of all, Charles Hannum is uh, uh, Karl Hirschland, um, a trilogy beginning, A Boy in Your Condition. Uh, Hirschland uh, also came on a kinder transport and um, lived until it's, uh, in Germany uh, for six year, nearly six years um, until he came to this country and was, of course, traumatized by that. Um, that needs, needs little, little explanation, I think. What is interesting is the way in which the trauma um, continues even into his adult life. Uh, at one stage, he's teaching temporarily and um, finds himself with a colleague who is a violent, violently anti-Semitic um, and utters, I mean, really dreadful um, anti-Semitic sentiments. But uh, Carl, or Charles, as he's become, finds himself uh, paralyzed and unable, actually, to stand up to this and say, well, I'm Jewish myself. My last um, text was uh, Ingrid Jacobi's Diaries, My Darling Diary, which uh, cover the years from her arrival in Britain, again, on a kinder transport. She and her older sister were sent to Falmouth in Cornwall, a uh, long way away from any refugee centre, um, where they managed by themselves. The mother did not escape. Her, her father came over, but the relations remained distant. Um, it, it, the diaries cover the period uh, until the mid-50s when she met her future husband and settled down. And they are very, very excellent diaries. Um, they're not so well known as the other four texts, but I recommend them highly for anybody who's interested in refugees and Nazism. Um, she, uh, Ingrid Jacobi, who, who I, I knew very well personally, um, she was a lovely lady, very forthright. Um, and um, she was mostly very well integrated. Um, uh, at one stage, she, um, she, she, she went to Oxford um, after the war, not, not to the university, do a secretarial course, and then worked for um, various bookshops. Uh, 
rid of um, uh, refugee booksellers, antiquarians, very famous ones. Um, at one stage, she was um, bus stop on the Banbury Road, um, where I, very near where I lived in my final year as a student there. Uh, and a young student um, approached her and said, uh, tried to pick her up, basically, said, Hello. You're too, you're too pretty to be English. And she was mortified. She said, why have I got my British passport? Yeah, right. so I'd much rather he'd said, you're too English to be pretty. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, it's not the normal sort of thing. This is, uh, sometimes the trauma of the loss of her mother and the loss of her home city um, broke through. And um, when she visited some long lost friends from Vienna in, at Christmas 1944, she found that their daughter, her childhood playmate, had forgotten their shared past, just finished with this brief quotation. I wanted her to be a child again, a child in Vienna, my school friend romping and playing with me. I wanted to catch hold of her grown up hair and uncurl it and put it back into pigtails. I wanted to take her grown up clothes off and dress her in her little girl's pleated skirt that I used to like. I wanted to squeeze her brain and crush out all her Englishness, her ideas poisoned by England. Poisoned? But England is my country, English is my language. But at that moment, they were the murderers of my Viennese past. I longed for us all to be back in Vienna and that Hitler and the war had never happened. Thank you very much. Now, at this point in the proceedings, Monica von Dutchman was to have spoken, uh, but we would like to keep Monica with us. We think she may be listening silently on Zoom, but she will certainly watch this uh, in its recorded version. So let me tell you about Monica, and then our art historical colleagues are going to say a couple of words as we look through some of the uh, images that Monica would have spoken about. So Monica is an independent writer, lecturer, and curator. Based in London, the institutions she has worked for include the Courtauld Institute, Sotheby's Institute, the Tate, the National Gallery, Birkbeck University of London, the Royal Academy of Arts, and New York University in London. And for us, she taught for many years our art and war course, and last semester she was a distinguished research fellow. And that is one of the reasons why we are the hosts of this lovely event. She has uh, curated many exhibitions over the years, and her numerous publications include Art and the Second World War of 2013. She's the founding director of Insiders Outsiders, an ongoing celebration of the contribution of refugees from Nazi Europe to British culture, and contributing editor of its companion volume, Insiders Outsiders, Refugees from Nazi Europe and their Contribution to British Literary Culture 2019. So let's have some images, and if you wouldn't mind. And right. if you would introduce yourself briefly. I'm Michael Dixon, I'm one of the members of the Research Centre for German and Austrian Exile Studies. Um, from 2011 to 20, I was head of curatorial services at Benary Gallery and Museum. And a few of the images that um, are on Monica's presentation are of works that come from Benary's collections. And I hope I can say a little bit about them. Um, but I was literally only asked to do this about five minutes. Yes. Fantastic work. <laughs> um, so I will actually start just by reading Monica's introductory paragraph, if I may. Is there a copy of the book? Okay. Um, so the title of Monica's talk, Innocence Solid, Innocence Redeemed, Images of Childhood and the Work of Emigre Artists in the UK after 1933. Um, so Monica begins with a quote. She says, as American scholar Marianne Hirsch has astutely observed, I quote, in the postmodern moment, the family occupies a powerful and powerfully threatened place, structurally a last vestige of protection against war, racism, exile, and cultural displacement. It becomes particularly vulnerable to those violent ruptures, and so is a measure of their devastation. And at the epicenter of the family nexus, clearly, is the figure of the child that the family has not always been viewed 
primarily in this troubling light, however, is borne out by the diverse ways children have been represented in the history of Western art. So we're going to look at some of Monica's images. And she begins with uh, Roman Halter. Now, Roman Halter was a uh, Polish born Jewish, um, had a very traumatic um, experience, lost many members of his family, and he promised his grandfather before he uh, fled uh, from the ghetto that he would survive and he would give testimony to future generations. And he eventually arrived in the UK in 1945 and he trained as an architect. And he didn't really talk about his experiences in the Holocaust until much later in his life. And we start to see work emerging in the 70s. He worked a lot as a stained glass artist um, making windows for synagogues. And um, you can see here mothers with babies from 1974. Um, now, Joseph Herman, we're very honored actually to have Joseph's son David with us. And I'm sure he will be able to add far more profound comments about his father than I will be able to make. But I'd just like to very briefly say this image, which came into the Benary collection relatively recently. Um, it's a very important uh, refugee work by Herman, a fellow Polish Jewish uh, refugee. And uh, it uses a palette that, uh, a colored palette that Herman then abandoned. It refers to Polish Jewish imagery, which he also then abandoned in exile. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Joseph Herman as the painter of minors. But before that, he worked on imagery that recalled his Jewish past in Poland. And here you can see in this work, this very distinctive palette that perhaps recalls Chagall. And you can see the very distinctive um, architecture of Poland. Uh, you can see the sort of swirling sky is kind of Chagall-esque. And then you have the the cat uh, with a mouse in its mouth dripping blood, which symbolizing which symbolizes the Nazi oppressor. And you have the family fleeing this kind of eternal image that could be repeated endlessly. I mean, look at the news we see today. There's the family, the father, the mother clutching a tiny baby, a young child with her hand stuffed in her mouth in terror. And that's also become uh, the lead image for Insiders Outsiders. So if you go on the website and if you see the publication, this is the cover image that's that's been um, utilized. Um, Anna talked very briefly, I think, about in internment and the importance of the relationship with children. This is Fred Ullman, who uh, was a German-born lawyer, um, was interned in the Isle of Man, uh, where he really turned to drawing. <coughs> His daughter Catherine was born while he was in captivity. So he, he hadn't actually met his baby daughter at the time that he was making these drawings. And here she is, as Anna says, as a symbol of hope and of hope for the future. Um, this is Ava Frankfurter, who came as a young child, um, as an emigre, and although she had formal art training, she then turned her back on her emigre family, and she moved to the sort of periphery of London, she moved to the East End, uh, she worked in Lyons Corner House, where she met emigres from all sorts of other communities, and here you can see that she's, she's um, illustrating the Windrush generation, the first emigres who came from the Caribbean, and we have this very touching family scene, which uh, also belongs to Ben Uri. Um, Franta Belsky, um, a Czech emigre sculptor, um, scenes of mother and children, we have the lesson. Oscar Niemann, who's actually Croatian born again, another tender scene of mother and child, uh, slightly less literally representative with this elongated maternal figure holding the child. And there again, a slightly earlier view of the same work. And returning again to Joseph Herman, Memory of a Pogrom, again, another example of these early works made when he was first in exile here. Um, he traveled through a number of European countries, ended up in Glasgow. And here you have the scene again, the mother um, clutching the baby, perhaps evoking scenes like Guernica, you know, scenes of devastation. And then Jankel Adler, who was Herman's sort of compatriot in Glasgow, fellow Polish Jewish refugee, and they are the two orphans clinging to each other. 
because both of them lost many, many members of their family in the Holocaust. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel, for stepping into the breach of a moment's notice so you will hear again from you on your own work in the next while. I'm now going to invite Julia Winkler to speak. Uh, she's a photographer and a principal lecturer at the University of Brighton, where she co-leads the visual culture, memory and history of Scram at the Centre for Memory, Narrative and Histories. She's exhibited and published widely on memory and migration narratives, contested topographies, exile and loss. She's published recently on uh, Rod Sojitsky and um, also focused on narratives of exile. Uh, in her new mo monograph, Fabricating Luraland, published in De Gruyter's Cultural Memory Series, Winkler explores the garden city narrative as a form of social utopia and interrogates a previously underexplored archival collection through visual and creative research methods combined with oral history. So, Julia. Thank you very much, Kathleen. If we could have the first image, please, that would be great. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, I'm just going to talk very briefly about one particular book um, that Wolf Sushitsky, who's already been mentioned, who was a photographer based in London, um, who died in 2016 at the age of 104. I think many of you knew him, but have met him in different locations, uh, made in 1946 together with Lisa Franco, um, who was a child psychologist. Both Wolf Sushitsky and Lisa Lotte-Franco were from Vienna and came to England in the 1930s. And this, this is the only example of a joint collaboration between Wolsichitsky and Lisa Lotte Frankel that I have found. There might be others, but I, I have looked quite hard. So I think it's the only time they work together. And for this publication, I chose to focus entirely on this one on, on this one book because it is quite extraordinary. The story of the book is quite is quite exceptional. I think groundbreaking for the time. So what's what's so fascinating I think about the book is that firstly it was published in 1946, so just just within a year um, of, at the of the end of the of the Second World War. Um, it has a child centered focus and a very child centered message. Um, it was also written for parents and children, um, which I think is unusual to have a book both for pa parents and children. It was designed and produced by Apprint. Anna Neidberg could talk extensively about Apprint. You've written a whole book on the contribution of emigre publishers, in including Apprint. So Apprint put together the publication and it included 24 beautifully reproduced color photographs taken by Wolsichitsky, who mainly worked in black and white. So mm -hmm. it's quite unusual to have all these color photographs in the publication. Wolsichitsky made these photographs in different London locations, including at the Hampstead Nurseries, which were at the time run by Anna Freud. So this is another unusual, I think, coincidence that makes the book memorable. The accompanying text was written by the child psychologist Lisa Lotte Frankel, who was one of the first women to get a PhD in child psychology in Vienna and knew Anna Freud at the time in the 1930s. And then again, the two women met in London in exile. Um, the publication marked an innovative approach in the overall design and storyline. Um, and uh, the focus on understanding children's developmental and psychological needs, I think, is, was very unusual for the times because it reflected the uncertainties of childhood in a sympathetic and educational way. Um, and focuses, if you could have the next slide, please. Okay, yes, just the, here, this was the frontispiece piece of the book. and. It's especially that the two, Bolt and uh, Lisa Lotte Frankel, especially thanked Anna Freud and Dorothy Birmingham for permission to take photographs in the Hampstead Nursery, which is how I initially discovered that, that many of the photographs taken inside buildings were taken there, that you will recognize perhaps some of the nursery locations. If you could have, if you could have the next slide, please. Um, so the book focuses on three-year-old, a three-year-old boy 
um, whose parents are expecting their second child. And throughout the book, Peter, the three-year-old boy, is shown to go through a whole range of emotions, from confusion to jealousy to defiance to aggression to anxiety and expectation. When his little brother Stephen is born, he instantly wants to play with him, but realizes very quickly that this isn't yet possible. In fact, there's one image where he puts this very large um, to toy train on top of the little baby and he runs with him in the process. Um, the mother then also takes um, her, her son outside for treats um, so that he can still feel special and focuses on him and his own needs, which is, I think, again, quite unusual to, to, for the times to say that, that the first child does need attention and does need to be looked after. Uh, Peter also helps, so then he's involved in activities. So he's asked to help Stephen, um, asked to help plan Stephen's first birthday party. And then the last couple of images of the book, um, when, when Stephen is one, one year old, one and a half years old, uh, the two boys are actually shown playing together, which is what the older brother had always hoped for. So at print, um, that, at print the, the, um, we put the book together, created some of the first color photographs, uh, phot photography books for children in the immediate post-war period. Um, in order to produce the very professional, as you will agree, that they're beautifully rendered, the color photography required, Wolstoszewski used a very unusual, difficult to use camera um, with half transparent mirrors, which made three separate color negatives at the same time. It could then be superimposed to create this very strong color prints, which were also easy to print, apparently. Um, and I feel that these give the book a very documentary realist style. Um, so they look almost like a documentary <laughs> photograph. They don't, some of them don't feel that stage, and they've also been taken from a child's perspective. The height, the angles of the photographs are those of children. The children are not being looked down upon. Every scene look, kind of has the perspective of it, takes the perspective of a young child. So the book, on the one hand, echoed the sensitivities of the photographer, along with the deep understanding of child psychology that, that Lisa Lotte Frankel had, and they make this a groundbreaking book for the time. It was, of course, part of a canon of children's books written by emigres in Britain that contributed to the better understanding of children's developmental needs. And I could have looked at many other books, but it seemed fitting to look at this particular one for the publication. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to invite Inez Schlenker to speak. Inez studied art history at Courtauld, uh, where she also completed her PhD. She's an independent art historian with a special interest in national socialist degenerate and emigre art. Hitler's Salon, her study of officially approved art in the Third Reich, as shown at the Great German Art Exhibition, was published in 2007. She wrote the catalogue raisonné of the paintings of Vienna-born émigré Marie-Louise von Montesquieu, <laughs> co-edited the artist's uh, correspondence with the writer Elias Canetti and curated the exhibition at Tate Britain that celebrate, celebrated the opening of Marie-Louise von <laughs> Capturing time, her study of the life and work of the emigre artist Milaine Cosman came out in 2019, while her Marc Chagall Masters of Art was published in 2022. Please join me in welcoming Ines. Since the 1930s, a considerable number of children's books in Britain have been illustrated by artists who have been forced to leave their country of origin due to the rise of National Socialism. Judith Kurt, The Tiger Who Came to Tea, is one of the best-selling children's books of all time. Another of Britain's best-loved authors and illustrators, Jan Kinkowski, created the elaborate pop-up book Haunted House. Both are on the 2021 Book Trust list of the 100 best books of the last 100 years for children. Also on this illustrious list are a substantial number of emigrate children's book illustrators, in many cases also authors, who are often lesser known. 
In my chapter, I investigate the wide ranging and significant output and examine how the cultural influences of a foreign upbringing and the experience of exile provide inspiration for their work. Some artists could already look back on a long career in children's book illustrations when they came to Britain. Among them were famed illustrators from Weimar, Germany, such as Walter Trier, whose cover for Erich Kästner's Emil und die Detektive remains iconic. A younger generation of artists, like the Polish design duo Luit Him, had just started out on their careers in a native country. Still younger artists, such as Milan Kosman, Susan Einzig and Fritz Wegner, left their homeland as teenagers and received their artistic education in Britain before embarking on their careers. Across these generations, the artists brought with them a wealth of traditions, cultures, and aesthetics from their mother countries, as well as experiences of persecution, flight, and loss. These fed into and found expression in their uniquely imaginative creative work in exile, which made these difficult experiences intuitively graspable for children. Merging their personal traditions with modernist ideas, Emigre children's book illustrators made a lasting impact on British book design through their often innovative use of color, imaginative abstraction on new media, employing a variety of hand-drawn, printed, painted, or photographic forms of imagery in a wide array of styles. Emigre artists worked across the entire range of categories and genres for children, while being drawn particularly to three distinct subject areas fairy tales, animals, and the experience of exile. Many artists tried their hand at illustrating the fairy and folk tales known from their own German, Austrian, Polish, or Czech upbringing in exile. The large collections of fairy tales by the Brothers Grimm were especially popular, as was Till Eulenspiegel, a classic children's book on the continent, but hardly known in Britain. Another favorite theme were animals, Proven to engage children's interests and a universal means of creating both distance and empathy, emigre artists used animals to gently introduce the concept of foreigners to British children and approach emotional topics without scaring young readers off. A considerable number of children's books by emigres take their subject straight from lived experience. Blue Peter, illustrated by Louis Tim and published in 1943, is an exceptionally touching example of how children can be presented with stories of exile that also employs animals as central characters. The book follows the fate of a blue puppy born to a white mother, kicked out by his master and subsequently maltreated, incarcerated and excluded for being different. Peter finally finds acceptance and peace on blue dogs islands. <laughs> Emigre artists had a lasting influence on children's publishing in Britain with their idiosyncratic knowledge, taste and skills acquired abroad and through their experience of exile. Although most are not household names, some achieved fame and recognition in publishing circles, receiving awards and prizes. Many of their books enjoyed reprints, subsequent editions and translations into various languages. Several also worked as teachers thus leaving a lasting influence on the next generation of British illustrators. The emigre artists who illustrated children's books are no longer with us. Their creations, which hark back to their foreign identities and already have been enjoyed by generations, remain relevant. They continue to inspire empathy for others, offer solace and inform and stimulate the imagination of artists and young readers all over the world. And now it's my pleasure to invite back Rachel mm -hmm. mm -hmm. as yourself, as yourself uh, uh, Rachel, previously head of curatorial services at Ben Uri Gallery and Museum London, is now consultant editor at the Ben Uri Research Institute, which focuses on the emigre contribution to visual culture in Britain since 1900. A committee member of the Research Centre for German and Austrian Exile Studies at the University of London. She has written and spoken regularly on creative emigres in the UK and their contribution to the fine and applied arts. The chapter on Elizabeth Tomalin as a pioneering textile designer was included in Exile and Gender, 
um, and she has a forthcoming chapter on Ben Yuri and the emigre contribution to music. I'm a second and third generation artist, mother and daughter, Helga Michi and Ruth Ricks, which is due for publication in 2022. Yes, I think that's, yes, that's history. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm hopefully going to follow on rather neatly from Innes, and I'm going to introduce you to um, another uh, woman who contributed to children's, uh, woman emigre who contributed to children's illustrated uh, literature. So I'm going to introduce you to the life and work of a distinctive and experimental emigre, uh, Renata Meyer, who turned her own experiences of growing up in a foreign country dealing with her identity and with assimilation into source material for a series of self-penned and self-illustrated children's books, as well as a unique autobiographical installation. So Renata Meyer was born into a comfortable middle-class Jewish family in Charlottenburg, Berlin in 1930, daughter of a physician at the renowned Charity Hospital. Following the rise of Nazism, Meyer settled in England with her immediate family in 33, then returned briefly to Germany with a bout of ill health the following year. Her father eventually established a successful GP practice in London, and they all gained British citizenship in 1939. Her formal art training was at Regent Street's Poly, where she met her future husband, Charles Keeping, one of the great illustrators of 20th century children's books, including the Charles Dickens series for the Folio Society. From the outset, Maya had a particular interest in children as subjects in her art. Prior to the birth of her own three children and adoption of a previously fostered son born in the Caribbean. Some of these works were shown at Benary's exhibition, Three Young Painters in 1955, where Maya featured alongside two male contemporaries, Alfred Harris and Lawrence Markerson. One of the largest exhibits was her painting, Howley Day Nursery Brixton, which showed babies swaddled and asleep outdoors at the nursery on the corner of Brixton and Vassal Roads, and described as, quote, some of the first generation of post-war black children in Lambeth, end quote, when the painting belonged to Nottinghamshire Education Committee's teaching aid service. Indeed, it's Maya's tantalizing presence in Benary's collection, which was the catalyst for my research interest. The permanent collection catalogue from 1994, which um, lists these three costume designs, has barely one small inaccurate paragraph on Maya. As I researched further, Maya was gradually revealed not only as a versatile painter and an experimental printmaker, but also as a successful children's book illustrator providing cover designs for well-known English children's writers such as Helen Cresswell and producing her own series of illustrated books published by the Bodley Head between 1968 and 73 under managing director Emigre Max Reinhardt. Maya produced books in two formats, standalone picture books without words and combined text and image. Both formats showcase her unconventional printmaking techniques and at the heart of each are Maya's own deeply personal anxieties and experiences of a refugee childhood, motherhood, and the lives of her own children. Her first publication for the Bodley Head was the picture book Vicky. Although the title shares the same name as Maya's daughter, the spelling is different, and the model was in fact a neighbor. The imagery utilizes a range of found objects, such as leaves, grasses, and lace, and even the doll, who is a central character, was first knitted by Maya and then used in the printing process. The flyleaf acutely observes, I quote, this is a picture book with a difference. It is literally a picture book, for there are no words at all. Maya's full color drawings tell the story of a small girl who is by herself and lonely. Through her grief comes the determination to do without human friends. She will make herself a playfellow, end quote. Children's book historian Brian Alderson acknowledged, however, that Vicky presented Maya's reviewers with, quote, serious problems of assessment, end quote, not only in its experimental visual approach, but also in its unusual point of view as, quote, more than anything, a pictorial exploration of the intensity of child feelings, 
demanding not so much to be explained as to be felt, end quote. Vicky was also praised in The Guardian. However, the reviewer observed that, quote, some critics considered both theme and style too sophisticated for children to understand, end quote. In 71, the Bodley had published the story of Little Nittle and Threadle. Written and illustrated by Maya, it is the tale of a sewn girl and a knitted boy fall in love and grow up to have a child, Early, who is herself both knitted and sewn. The tale highlights the ensuing tensions engendered by her mixed identity. Beneath the charming images lie an altogether more serious message, inspired by Maya's own difficult childhood. Then, as a radical departure from her children's books, from the late 1970s onwards, Maya refocused her practice towards textiles, creating several large-scale projects and installations, including her family story, a remarkable room-sized autobiographical frieze in the family home in South London, begun in 1982 and created using mixed media, accompanied by often lengthy stitched narratives. Frequently revealing a deeply personal commentary, text and images combine to create a rich and complex collage whose graphic sources derive from magazines, newspapers, packaging, and other paper ephemera of the time. Here was an emigre unintentionally using a pop art aesthetic to present her experience of migration and identity. And Maya wrote a quote, this is a picture story about my family. A core theme of my work is the need to assimilate and being the first generation in a new country and culture, the inevitable problems that this entailed, end quote. And it's striking just how quintessentially British, ordinary and quotidian are her paper sources, including packaging for bird's eye frozen peas and Bassett's licorice all sorts. The brightly coloured all sorts image marks the birth of her younger brother, Robert, in 1936, while the family's naturalization in 1938 and the outbreak of war in 39 are represented by images vividly colored in patriotic red, white, and blue, inspired by Ajax and Brillo packaging, respectively. And you can still see the frieze today in situ in the Keeping Gallery in Maya's former home in Shortland, South London, outside a blue plaque installed by Bromley Council, matching an earlier one for Charles Keeping, now proudly confirms that Renata Meyer Artis lived here. Thank you. Thank you. And now, last but not least, we will invite Sean Roberts to speak. Sean, I'm saying that right. Yes, you are. Sean is a lecturer in education and social justice at the School of Education at the University of Birmingham. She worked as an archivist and curator in the heritage sector before moving to work in higher education. She completed her doctorate at the University of Birmingham in 2010 on the educational activism of the humanitarian relief worker, teacher and refugee advocate, Francesca Wilson. She's a historian of education and childhood and has published several articles and book chapters in these areas. Her research interests include British Quaker women active in education, humanitarian and refugee issues, educational interventions with children and young people in contexts of war or displacement, and women refugee educators who arrived in the UK in the first half of the 20th century. Please join me in welcoming Sean. Thank you, Sean. Thank you very much for those kind words. Um, so my chapter focuses on the refugee educator and teacher, um, Hilda Yarecki, who you can see um, sitting here uh, in a photograph from The Guardian in 1989 with her companion and life partner, um, Sophie Friedlander. And I focus in particular on the contribution that Hilda made to early years learning, um, both in her role as um, advisor to the Inner London Playgroups Association, but also as the author of her book, uh, Playgroups, The Practical Approach, which she published in 1975. Um, and what you see on that side of the slide is one of the illustrations um, from her book, 
play groups. Could we have the next slide, please? Thank you. So Hilda believed that a democratic and tolerant society depended on the proper development and early education of the child. And she advocated for the crucial role that preschool play groups could play in this process. So in the chapter, I explore her ideas on child development and her belief that play groups could make an active contribution to building a more democratic and equal society. And she thought that would come about through educating the child in the development of peaceful and loving human relationships, and that that would bear fruit um, as the child grew to be an adult. So who was she? Well, she, Hilda was born in Berlin in 1911, um, and she trained in progressive social pedagogy and kindergarten um, teaching in Berlin. This laid the foundations for her later approaches and her ideas about the essential role of education in supporting democracy um, and tolerance. From 1933, she was um, forced to teach in the Jewish educational sector in Germany due to the um, restrictive um, work policies introduced by the Nazi regime. And one of the appointments that she held was as a house mother at the Jewish Kinder und Landschulheim in Kekuth, where she met her companion in later life, um, the teacher Sophie Friedlander. And Sophie shared many of her interests and also um, her progressive approach to education. Both women came to England um, as refugees. Sophie arrived in September 1938 and Hilda came a few months later in 1939. Um, she came, as many did, on a domestic um, service, um, you know, um, permit. Uh, but she only worked as a domestic servant for about 10 weeks um, and was then able to return to working with teachers and the, uh, with children and young people, initially with young um, refugee women and children in hostels. So... Um, Hilda and Sophie um, ran the hostel um, in Selly Oak, Birmingham, which is where I first encountered them, as it were, between 1940 and 1942. Um, and after that, they ran a similar hostel um, in Reading until 1955. After that, they both moved to London, uh, where Sophie taught at a girls' grammar school, and Hilda went on to study child development um, at the Institute of Education, not far from here, um, where she was influenced by the ideas of um, Donald Winnicott and, and other um, psychologists and, and people interested in, in the psychological development of the child. After a few different jobs, um, in 1964, she was appointed as the first professional advisor to the Inner London Playgroups Association. And in this capacity, she encouraged the development of, of new voluntary playgroups, um, usually set up by the parents. Um, she believed very strongly in the role of the mother. And she also created training opportunities and support networks for the playgroup leaders and the mothers who worked in the playgroups. Um, she actually influenced quite a lot of the mothers to return to adult education. Um, you know, she sort of hooked them with um, their interest in the development of their own child to begin with, and then broadened their interests into, um, you know, wider areas of, of psychology and indeed other topics. So in her approach to playgroup work, she drew um, on her early training in psychologically informed social pedagogy in Germany and on her experiences of teaching and living 
in progressive Jewish educational institutions before her enforced exile um, in Britain. And interestingly, her personal experience of exile, like many of the people we've heard about already, also influenced her practice. And she ascribed her attitude and her approach um, partly to the experience of being a refugee and being displaced, writing that, quote, having to adapt myself to the language and the ways of another country have made me adaptable to many different situations and people from the most varied backgrounds. So just to conclude briefly, um, Hilda undoubtedly made a valuable contribution to early years learning through play. Um, and her story is part of the important but um, hitherto under-researched topic of the educational legacies of refugee educators and teachers who came to Britain. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of our speakers this evening and to invite Anna back to invite Kiana. Thank you very much. Well, I wonder if there are any questions or comments that anybody would like to make. We've had a very wide variety of interesting talks. You'd like to ask something. David. When I can do a copy of the book. <laughs> <laughs> That's our favourite question. <laughs> we do have books on sale, just around the corner. A uh, special price tonight with a discount. Where's Kat? So it's going to be £1.50. There we are. And you can do it on your phone, apparently. Oh, um, <laughs> otherwise, if you don't do that sort of thing, we have flyers uh, where you have the information yeah. how to get them um, more conventional, old fashioned ways. Oh, that's an excellent question. Thank you, David. <laughs> yes. I have a question for Sean. Um, I was very interested that you brought up Winnicott um, mm -hmm. in your presentation. And I know um, that he, had, he wrote very early in 1939 about the legacy of evacuation for British children and uh, warning that this was going to have a very, very long tail into British social life. Do we find traces of talking about kinder transport children in burgeoning um, discourses of object relations theory and child psychology. Is, is there a specific line that addresses this? You mean in, in her work? Or just, just more generally, I'm just wondering um, how this might show up in the field. Yeah, I mean, she, she doesn't talk very much about that sort of thing. Um, or not, certainly not in the in the material I've looked at. She's more interested in these ideas about attachment theory and the role of the mother um, in, in socialising and, and educating the child. So I don't really know is the, is the answer to that. I'm afraid. <laughs> Somebody else may do, though. Yes, Kat? I'm not sure this is a question you can answer, but I was just wondering, um, it was quite trendy, I think, for Germans to send, for Ostras Germans to send their children to boarding school in Britain. Um, and that would have been Jewish children who would have been sent because it was better for them to be out of the German school system. But it would have been upper class Nazis sending kids to learn German. I was wondering if anyone came across anything like that, where the kids would have been perceived as German and foreigners, and, and, and how they negotiated being together in school, and if there was anything about that. Next time, I'm going to ask you. <laughs> I don't think we know about that. Yeah. There's a whole, um, I think it's a new book out on Bugs Court, is that not? Yeah. yeah. Uh, very interesting, which was founded by a refugee woman, I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Monica yeah. Rambo. Yeah. And it's all about it, yes. And uh, very many refugee children went there, and it was a sort of home from home, I think. 
I'm pretty sure it's Frank Alcock. Yes, yes, Frank Alcock. Yes. Yes. He was there, yes. And she ran a school in Germany. Uh, yeah, and that's she ran the school. Yes, in Germany, it's yes. a uh, house. Yeah. So the house where he was arrested, I think. That's right. It's There's been a lot about Frank Alcock in the yes. press recently yes. because he has an exhibition yes. on at uh, Courtauld and so on. And he was being on radio for a couple of times and yes. talked about his life. And he mentioned Bud's Court. Thank you for reminding us. Yes. And then, of course, you've got Kurt Hahn, who came to uh, Harlem and founded Gordon. Yes. And more upper class than being Prince Charles. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Lots of um, sort of new yes. ideas about education, I think, came from from Darshan to the Hall. Number of um, sort of creative emigres who are from a strong range of disciplines from contemporary dancing and poetry, dancing turn. This is another of, of Monica's mushrooms that I mentioned. <laughs> to have a symposium on refugees at Dartington. Mm -hmm. um, everything, dancers, as you say, all sorts of yeah, yeah, and the educational side of that as well. A bit like some of it all was yeah. Yeah, Peter. Quick question, Sharp, or somebody, I think it was Sharp, said that a third of emigrees returned. Um, and I just wondered whether I misheard or whether where that figure came from, because it surprised me. No, I didn't say that. I'm sorry. I said a third of the members of Young Austria and Free German Youth returned. It is calculated. There are actually figures relating to the Germans that uh, roughly speaking, uh, 200 stayed here, 200 emigrated further, and 200 went back. Uh, we can only assume that with the Austrians it was the same sort of proportions, but there are actually no figures for that. So I think I'm speaking as Charles' area of expertise, but it tended to be the political uh, refugees, didn't mm -hmm. they, yes. who were interested in starting east you know to go back and build up east germany the new country and or hope what they hoped would be a socialist austria um, and in fact we might possibly make this the uh, subject of returnees one of the subjects of our, our new year book so the research center for german austrian exiles so it's a very um not very well covered topic but which we hope to cover yeah so yeah i have got a question for you um or it's more a comment, really, uh, about the, you were talking about uh, uh, refugee mothers uh, and the prospect of giving birth in the late 30s and even more so during the war. I wondered if you'd come across uh, the, the, the phenomenon of refugee mothers holding back by fathers um, from having children while it was a possibility, of course, that the Nazis might invade or that Hitler would win the war. But the once the tide turned, uh, there were quite a number of refugee children born. I born in 1944 myself, <laughs> uh, after the battles of, of Stalingrad and Ella May. It's very interesting hearing that for the other people in the room who fall into that category. But uh, it makes sense, doesn't it? When the tide was turning in the war, that people thought, oh, perhaps we can risk it after all, but we're still able to have children. I didn't encounter it, but it makes sense. And, and of course, it's echoed in all sorts of situations, isn't it? When the economy is poor and you think you might not be able to work or there's possible war. But that's uh, very interesting. Now, that would have been a perfect fit for my chapter, but there was enough to play, really, <laughs> already. Yeah, it's a way of, of showing your, a personal way of beating Hitler in a way. Yes, but it has a lot of relatives in yes. one generation, which you can bring another generation. Yes, yeah. as Hilda Kurt said, there are enough Jews being murdered. Let's say, yes. Let's have the news. I've got a little comment from Sean. Um, when I was researching um, the artist Helga Mickey, mm -hmm. and her daughter, she, sure. when I was researching the artist Helga Mickey, who was a, uh, came from Austria and her daughter Ruth Ritz, Ruth was as a young girl in the Reading homes, oh, nice. and there was one bum, Hilda. So I don't know if you've ever come across Ruth and whether she might 
I think there might be some questions on the Zoom chat. Um, oh, you got one in the chat? Yeah, I think oh, there's one yes. in the chat. Uh, let me just find them, sorry. Um, someone's asked, um, was, I might mispronounce the names, I'm sorry. Okay. Was Hilda Drakey, um, was she trained at Alice Simmons Academy in Berlin? Did she know Dr. Hilda Lyon and Dr. Emmy Wolf, who had founded Stoutly Rough School in California? Oh, yes, on yeah. Hilda. She was certainly trained there. Um, and um, yes, I would, I mean, I don't know for certain, but I would assume that she knew Hilda Lyon as well. Okay, great. Let me just check if there's any more. Looks to be a very active. <laughs> yeah, I think that's all the questions. Well, the chat will be saved, won't it? When we, um... I think so. Yeah, I can make sure. Oh, yes, Marjorie Downwards. Yes, was she a lady that wrote about? I'm not sure. What's her name? Marjorie Downwood. Yes, we were going to have her at the symposium. She had to. Withdraw at the last minute. I remember, but uh, I can't remember which school. Let's see his next time when we're looking for the school. Well, we're just looking at those. I'll just comment on the cover of the book, throwing my tuppence worth. Um, the little boy you see forlornly sitting there. There he is. Yes. Um, he is Florian Weissenborn, and very grateful to his daughter for allowing us to use the photograph of her father. Uh, he was the son of somebody called Helmut Weissenborn, who was a, an artist, a printmaker, and also a great, he had his own publishing company and made lots of books for children as well. And uh, it was a very sad story 
uh, that, that Helmut Weissenborn wasn't actually Jewish, but his wife was. And so he lost his job in Germany uh, and fled to Britain. And it was while he was in turn that she divorced him and moved with the child to first to America and then to Argentina. And I think you can see it all written on his face that he was very, um, yeah, it was, it was very traumatic for him. And um, it just cut into his adult life as well. He was always a very damaged person and never managed to really settle or his father was quite strong and dominating, but uh, you know, I just I just wanted that photograph for the cover because as it did to me it spoke volumes. Any more questions before we move on to other things? Perhaps you'd like to talk to the speakers. Uh, and I would like once more to thank our host, um, Catherine uh, Robson, very, very much. <laughs> Thank you again to New York University for hosting us. We're very, very grateful um, and for covering as well for the, the lack of money. Thank you so much. And please join us for a drink uh, to eat. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much.